talking about uh, force continuum, and you were starting to say that the second level is verbal and continuum. So verbal resistance, if you will, would be somebody who could be cussing you out if you're a police officer and you, you are told to do something and you argue, that would be considered an escalation of force. And this is all about escalation, de-escalation, and proportionality. That's the idea of this chart. So the verbal level of resistance or threat would cue somebody that their mere presence may have to be stepped up. And to remain proportional, you can counter it with verbal instructions, you can dialogue, you can give warnings, you can do all those kind of things. But it remains verbal. We're not using uh, any type of physical force. It's still very low level. It's a level two response to a level two threat. Now, assuming that the subject escalates again, the lowest level of escalation from this point is what we would call passive escalation. This might mean, again, if you're a police officer, you tell somebody to do something, they just don't do it. Perhaps they behave as if they didn't hear you or they sit down intentionally to force themselves to be moved. This passive level can also happen, of course, in the civilian world, in the security world. Trespass is a good example. You have to leave here. You have to leave my house, and the person refuses to do it. That would be a passive level. In response to that, the appropriate level of force generally is empty hands. These are the things, the techniques, the defensive tactics that are taught with respect to what you're born with. Your punches, your kicks, your elbows, your knees, your grabs, your grips, your throws, all those kind of things would be empty hand. There's no weapon being introduced into the environment at this low level of resistance. It is a threat, but we're not introducing weapons. The next level is what we call active resistance. Active resistance generally means you're trying to overcome somebody. So let's talk about the civilian set. I'm in your house. You tell me to leave. I don't do anything, you grab me, and I snatch my arm away. I've escalated. I've tried to prevent you from taking authority. In law enforcement, there are far more examples because law enforcement has much more authority. When they call to a call, it doesn't have to be their own home before they can make somebody leave, for example. But generally, it is not a direct attack on the officer. We're not there yet. It's not a direct attack on the civilian. We're not there yet. So typically, we counter this with what we might refer to as intermediate weaponry. The intermediate weapons, and there are many of them out there. Law enforcement carry a whole bunch of them. We have things like pepper spray. We have tasers. We have batons. Civilians carry things like that, too. They carry pepper spray. Sometimes they carry personal tasers. And this is about the time when you would start considering escalating to that level. Intermediate weapons mean that my empty hand tactics are ineffective, but I can't justify the use of deadly force. So that's kind of how we lump this category together. Assuming that there's escalation, we would go from active to what we call aggressive threat. Aggressive threat means the fight is on. Somebody's actually doing something to harm me. They're attacking me. They're running towards me, swinging their fists. They're attacking in some sort of way, not in a deadly situation. It's not a case where somebody may be drawing for a weapon. That's a different category. It's a higher category. But they're aggressively attacking. The way that I would suppose most humans fight all the time is with their, their aggressive, barehanded skills, not escalating to, to lethal force. At this point, if you find yourself in a fight, we consider it reasonable to use what we call um, temporary temporary incapacitation. I'll have to abbreviate that because I'm out of space. Temporary incapacitation means that you're hitting back. You're either trying to knock back, knock down, or knock out. You're going for areas that are going to cause an effect. You're, causing, you're trying to cause somebody to stop their aggression, to de-escalate. And you're doing it with, for instance, punches to the face, kicks to the solar plexus, arguably neck restraints, things like that. Things that don't kill you, but stop you temporarily. So that's the next level. Yeah. Before you get to the next level, so just by way of example, I, I, you've been talking about proportionality. So let's say uh, that someone is, is at level one, presence. Yes. Um, as a response, could you jump to five? 
you could, but it would be considered by our definition unreasonable. Okay. Um, so same thing at presence, would it be unreasonable to go to four? Yes. Unreasonable to go to three? Yes. Okay. So basically, going across, that would be the proportional yes. and allowed response. Yes. So all of these should correspond. Now I should say it works in reverse. For example, if somebody attacks me aggressively and I decide to have words with them, that's okay. Your Honor, can we approach instruction that uh, your instructions on the law will be given by the judge at the close of the case uh, the witnesses are uh, not in a position to give you instructions on the law and you're not in a position to follow what uh, they may instruct you on as far as what the law is or your interpretation that they're instructing you on the law the only law that you should follow are the instructions that the judge gives you at the close of the case you may continue mr. Rosenwald and it is the six one. Oh, sorry. I apologize. Thank you. And is the sixth level the final level? Yes. Okay. So the ultimate level, obviously, is if somebody. Have same objection, Your Honor. It's continuing again. All right. Oh, go ahead. If somebody prevents what's called an aggravated threat, which generally means that they're aggressive and have the ability to use deadly force against you or somebody else. And the appropriate training instruction for law enforcement, self-defense classes, things like that, is we meet aggravated uh, threats with what we call deadly force. So this basically constitutes what's called a force continuum that's based on force options, that's based on threat assessment, understanding the conditions of the environment based on visual cues, and responding to them proportionally. Now, in the defendant's statement, he also brings up something that he calls the 21-foot rule, and we're gonna talk uh, in detail about it. First of all, have you ever heard that term before? Yes. All right, is there such thing as a 21-foot rule? No. Can you explain? Can you go back to the seat now? Are you done with the chart or not? We, we have one more chart. One more chart. One okay. more chart. All right, I'm so sorry. The last and final chart. All right, so the 21 foot rule is not really a rule, but you heard of the terminology. Yes. All right. Um, what is it? What is the 21 foot rule, so, so to speak? A little history. 1983, a law enforcement officer from Salt Lake City, Utah, by the name of Dennis Tuller, discovers probably what you already know, and that is that there is such a thing as reaction time. And Tula wrote an article in the SWAT magazine entitled, How Close is Too Close? Meaning, when you are addressing a threat as a SWAT operator, generally speaking, how close is too close before you'd be able to react 
to a very specific threat. And that threat is somebody with an edged weapon. Fast forward to 1988, a company called Caliber Press produced a video called Surviving Edged Weapons. And they played out the Tuller drill, which is what we refer to it as, using multiple trials, multiple officers, to examine what Tuller had concluded. That it takes time for you to be able to get your weapon out of your holster when you first identify a threat. So when you first identify a threat, the assumption is if that person is actively attacking, they're covering distance, how much space would you need to be able to actually address a knife attack with a firearm? Obviously, you have to get the gun in your hand first. And I don't know if you're familiar with modern law enforcement holsters, but they're designed as safety holsters to keep the weapon in. There's a lot of interesting straps and snaps and blocks that's configured into the design that's very specific to hold the weapon in if somebody grabs it. And that's good, except if you're trying to quick draw, it takes you a little bit of time to get it out. You've got to undo those straps and snaps and maneuver around those blocks to get the weapon out. It's generally assumed that it's going to take about 1.5 seconds tested it, we've examined it several times. So that's what the Tooler drill was. It was an expression of how far back should we start pulling our weapon and addressing the threat with two shots in 1.5 seconds. And when they examined it, they generally said it takes more than 20 feet. This is all based on what we call a quarter second reaction time. The ability to perceive something takes about 0.18 to 0.25 seconds. Your hand moving back, about 0.18 to 0.25 seconds. Grabbing the weapon, 0.18 to 0.25 seconds. Doing all the magic to release it, 0.18 to 0.25 seconds. Drawing it, about a quarter second. Extending it and addressing the target, about a quarter second. So there's about six things going on there. And if you multiply that times 0.25, you'll come up with 1.5 seconds. So that's what the drill was. And it has actually had a lot of influence on training both in the civilian environment and in law enforcement. There are drills now that are conducted at what we call the seven yard line. When you qualify NRA courses, when you qualify for law enforcement, there's a moment where we will stand you seven yards from a target and give you 1.5 seconds to, what, to pull your weapon and address the target in that time frame. So that's the, that's the test, if you will. But it's not a rule. It's really just sort of a, a healthy respect for understanding that somebody standing close to you that may have an edged weapon do real harm before you could get your weapon out of the holster. Okay, uh, just a couple things to talk about. So one, this tool or drill was really designed for law enforcement. Yes, Okay. well and, by law enforcement for sure. Okay, by law enforcement really in training law enforcement. Yes. All right, and you indicated uh, just something about the, the holster. A holster for law enforcement may by design be a little more difficult to take a firearm out of. Yeah, they're, they're significantly significant, uh, um, sophisticated. Okay, and that would then factor into the time frame. Yes. All right, but it sounds like what you're testifying is that there's three components of this Tooler drill, which the defendant refers to as the 21-foot rule, correct? Yes. Okay, so the, the first component, would that be that it, it, in the drill, the officer has not yet unholstered the firearm? Yes. Okay, can we write that as number one? That would be the firearm is still in the holster. Okay. Number two, you were saying that in the Tooler drill, the person that had the edged weapon was advancing. Yes. Okay. So could you put that uh, number two, that the person or aggressor, or however you want to say it, is advancing? critical that I include as weapon because that's what the drill is about. Okay. And that was going to be the, the third position. The third important part of the Tula drill, which the defendant referred to as the 21-foot rule, is that the person that is advancing has an edge weapon. Yes. Okay. Can you put that as the, the third principle, we'll call it? I'll put retains edge weapon because there's some possibility that your appraisal may conclude that they've dropped it along the way. Okay. Now, it, common sense, edge weapon would be a knife. Yes. Anything else that, that could 
that you would think of? Anything sharp, screwdrivers, bottles, uh, machetes, um, I suppose you could even argue a ballpoint pen, something that could puncture, slash, cut in some way. That's generally what we're training the tooler drill against. Okay, so you know, for example, you have to have all three. Yes. Okay, so if you don't have one, tooler drill or 21 foot rule doesn't even apply. Right. If you don't have number two, doesn't apply. Right. Don't have number three, doesn't apply. That's correct. 